Good evening, everybody. Welcome again to our AJA Zoom event. Welcome to our regulars. And if you're new to us this week, welcome to you as well. We also want to welcome people listening on J Air. We, we are now streaming these AJA Zoom sessions uh, via Facebook, but also on J Air Jewish Community Radio in Melbourne. So if you're in Melbourne, it's 88 FM. If you're elsewhere around the country or the world, it's J Air. Dot com dot au. My name is Alan Friedman. I'm Vice President of the Australian Jewish Association, and I am again the MC for this evening. Also visible on your screens are David Adler, President of the AJA, as well as our guest for tonight, Mike Myerson, who we will formally introduce in a moment. This week will again be a presentation style. Mike will speak uh, on his subject for about 30 minutes after which we will open up for questions from the audience. And as I always mention, uh, if you're in the, on, in the Zoom audience and you want to ask a question, then you need to raise your hand electronically. And you do that by clicking on the reactions icon at the bottom, and then you'll see a little hand, click on that. And then that lets us know that you want to ask a question. But if, uh, if you do prefer not to ask uh, a, a verbal question, then we can take written questions uh, these can be put on the chat function and we will read out some of those in between the spoken ones. This will be done by Robert Gregory, our research and advocacy officer. So he is <clears throat> the moderator for written questions and he may combine <clears throat> one or two of them if they are on similar themes. And of course, sometimes our speaker answers questions on some issue during the discussion. So in that case, we won't repeat the question. And as I always re remind people, uh, that there's a little icon uh, up in the top right hand corner which says view <clears throat> and you can toggle between speaker and gallery view. Now if there are two things that Jews are famous for or more correctly infamous for it's being handy with tools and good at sport. We're not going to hear about Jewish handymen tonight but we do want to take a look at whether the Jews are, are being being rather ordinary at sport is based in fact or is just a myth. I'm sure uh, many of us have participated in sport, some perhaps at a fairly high level. So is this notion justified or is it perhaps something that applied to previous generations when sporting activity was a much smaller part of people's lives, particularly in the shtetls? Well, our guest today is well placed to help us through all of this as he's the author of a book called are Jews really no good at sport? Mike Myerson is a radiologist who says that modest success in tennis left him with a rich collection of personal sporting stories and that, uh, and that ignited an interest in writing. His writing subsequently became influenced by an involvement in critical thinking. And this book on Jewish people in sport combines both these interests. It all sounds very fascinating and Mike joins us now to take us through the journey. Mike, thanks for joining us and welcome to, uh, to our Zoom session. Well, thank you for having me. I'd like to thank Dr. David Adler for inviting me to talk on Jews and sport and to thank you, Alan, for that introduction. So before I start, can I just check that my PowerPoint slides are visible? Yes, working well. Okay. Before I begin, I'd like to answer the question I've been asked so often. Why did I write this book? For as long as I can remember, I've noticed many people claim that Jews are no good at sport, but the evidence points to the opposite. So when I read an article by the journalist Philip Adams, in which he claimed that he can't think of too many Jewish sporting heroes, if you leave out David's gold medal skills with a slingshot, I decided to sift through the evidence myself. During the first half of this talk, I will discuss some of this factual evidence. The second half of the talk will be about a few of the Jewish athletes who are described in my book. Most Jews believe that Jews are no good at sport. This stereotype is so prevalent in popular culture that Jews themselves joke about it. One such tired joke is what is the shortest book in the world? The answer is Jewish sporting legends. Jews who claim that Jews are no good at sport are not in good company. In fact, they are in the company of the worst of racists. This is an excerpt from a Nazi propaganda handbook. 
Among the inferior races, the Jews have done nothing in the athletic sphere. They are surpassed even by the lowest of the Negro tribes. It wasn't, however, only German racists who claimed that Jews are no good at sport. Prior to Hitler's 1936 games, the American representative to the International Olympic Committee, General Charles H. Sherrill, said there never, never was a prominent Jewish athlete in history. Frederick Rubian, Secretary of the United States Olympic Committee, said, the Germans are not discriminating against Jews. The Jews were eliminated because they are not good enough athletes. So we have the anomalous situation where racists claim that Jews are no good at sport and Jews also claim that Jews are no good at sport. There is, however, an important difference. It is only the Jewish group who really believe this claim. During the Nazi era, the Germans were well aware of the many elite German Jewish athletes. That's why these Jews were banned from sport, their records were deleted, and they were barred from representing Germany. Some of these Jewish athletes fled Nazi Germany, others were imprisoned or killed. The 1936 Olympics were held in Berlin and became known as Hitler's Games. These games were intended to highlight the Aryan physical superiority through sporting achievements. The last thing the Nazis wanted was to be embarrassed by Jewish athletes winning medals at Hitler's Games. If Jews were no good at sport, there would have been no need to ban them from representing Germany or competing at the Olympics. Their chances of selection would have been zero. If Jews were no good at sport, why did they need to delete the records of Jewish athletes? Moreover, if the Nazis truly believed they were superior to another group, then instead of barring the inferior group from sporting competition, they should have encouraged the so-called inferior group to compete. In this way, the superior group would prove their superiority while humiliating the inferior people. So the Nazis and other racists knew that Jews are as good at sport as anyone else. The list of Jewish athletes amongst Nazi Germany's best is long. I will mention some of them because they illustrate the point I've just made. The Flatow cousins, both gymnasts, won six Olympic medals, five gold. They were killed by the Nazis. The Baruch brothers were German champion wrestlers. They were killed by the Nazis. Lili Hinoch, Germany's best female athlete in the 1920s, held world records in the shot, discus, and four times 100 meters. She was forced out of her club, and in 1942, she and her mother were killed by the Nazis. Ingeborg Mello was also accomplished at the shot and discus. She was banned from competing and fled to Argentina. She subsequently competed for Argentina at the 1948 and 1952 Olympics. Germany's champion middleweight boxer in 1931 was Erik Selig. Selig was stripped of his titles and fled Germany. He married hurdler Greta Meinstein, who fled Germany after the Nazis prevented her from competing in Hitler's 1936 games. Soccer Olympians Gottfried Fuchs and Julius Hirsch were two of the brilliant attacking trio of the German club Karlsruhe KFV. Fuchs was considered to be the best center forward in the world between 1911 and 1913. All references to Fuchs were deleted from the German records. He fled Nazi Germany. After retiring, Hirsch coached the KFV club until he was kicked out for being Jewish. Hirsch was deported to Auschwitz and never heard of again. Gretel Bergman was Germany's top female high jumper. She was not allowed to compete at Hitler's games and her records were deleted. Dr. David Prenn was Germany's top ranked tennis player from 1928 to 1932 and was ranked sixth in the world. He was barred from Davis Cup competition. He fled Germany. Ilse Friedlieben won the German Women's Tennis Championships on six occasions. She lost in the finals in 1925 to another Jewish German, Nelly Nepach. Friedlieben fled Germany. Nepach was forced out of sport and took her own life. Henry Laskal was a top 1500 meters runner. He was banned from representing Germany and imprisoned in a forced labor camp. Elias Katz won gold and silver medals at the 1924 Olympics as a middle distance runner. He was banned from competition and fled Nazi Germany. Martel Jacob was the German javelin champion. She was banned from competition. 
She fled Germany and was subsequently the English and then South African javelin champion. Paul Sommer and Hans Salberstadt were German fencing champions. Both fled Nazi Germany. Rudy Ball and Helene Mayer were idolized in Germany. Rudy Ball was Germany's top ice hockey player. Mayer was the world's number one fencer. Pentathlete Paul Mayer was excluded from selection for Hitler's games. Bergler Ernst Jockel was selected for the 1928 games. He was dismissed as director of the Institute of Sports Medicine in Breslau. Mayer and Jockel fled Germany. Hans Schlesinger was a certainty to keep goal for Germany's field hockey team for the 1936 games. He fled to the United States and competed for the US along with another German Jewish immigrant, Klaus athletes who were victimized by the Nazis. The persecution of Jewish athletes was, however, even worse in Nazi-aligned countries such as Hungary and Austria. I have counted 54 elite Jewish athletes who were killed by the Nazis. All played sport at an international level. 28 of them were Olympians. It is clear that the Nazis knew that the Jews were in reality good at sport, perhaps too good. The influential Australian journalist Philip Adams revitalized the myth that Jews are no good at sport when writing in the Weekend Australian a few years ago. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, Adams said that he can't think of too many Jewish sporting heroes if you leave out David's gold medal skills with a slingshot. He also said that it's hard to think of a Jewish golfer on the United States circuit. Yet a quick internet search uncovered 16 such golfers. What Adams's comment showed me was that despite the books describing the many brilliant Jewish athletes, people still believe the myth that Jews are no good at sport. What is needed to bury this falsehood is a yardstick of measurement with which the success of Jewish athletes can be measured. I have provided that gauge by comparing the successes of Jewish athletes at the modern Olympics with those of a country whose success at sport is beyond dispute, Australia. This is a good comparison because the numbers of the two groups are fairly similar. Currently, Australians number approximately 25 million and the world's Jewish population is about 15 million. Australia has, however, competed unhindered in every Olympic Games since the inception of the modern games in 1896. Jewish athletes have had to contend with bannings, genocide, boycotts, terrorism, and selection bigotry. As is evident, several countries have been prevented from competing in Olympics due to bannings and boycotts. This means that the Jewish athletes in those countries could not compete. While myths will forever be perpetuated, official records cannot be disputed. There are records of all the results at the modern Olympics since its inception in 1896. So let us first compare the medals won during the modern Olympics by the 10 most distinguished Australian Olympians with those won by 10 Jewish Olympians who are the most successful according to my tally. The Jewish athletes won a total of 71 medals, whereas the Australians won 77. But more striking is the, is the discrepancy in the gold medal count. Jewish athletes won 47 golds, compared to 39 won by the Australians. Nine of the 10 most distinguished Australian Olympians are swimmers. This is unsurprising because if we correct for population numbers, Australia is the most successful country in the world at swimming. The Jewish swimmers, however, surpass their Australian counterparts in terms of excellence. There is no Australian swimmer who compares to Mark Spitz, who is surely the hero of these heroes. In 1972, Spitz won seven Olympic goals, all in world record times. Few realize that Spitz's achievement was not entirely eclipsed by the American Michael Phelps 35 years later. While Phelps did win eight goals in 2008, only seven of these were in world record times. Moreover, Phelps owes one of these world records to the Jewish swimmer, Jason Lezak. 
Lizak came from a body length behind in the final leg, leg of the four times 100 meters to pip the 100 meter world record holder, Frenchman Alain Bernard by 0.08 seconds, setting a new world record in the process. The swim is still regarded as the best relay leg ever and gave Phelps his seventh world record. Notably, there is a Jewish woman who has won even more medals than Spitz's 11. Dora Torres won 12 Olympic medals, four of each color. No Australian has won as many medals as either Spitz or Torres, although Emma McKeon is close with 11 medals, five gold. I've compared the medals won by the top 10 Australian and Jewish Olympians. Time does not allow me to compare the medal counts in all Olympic sports. I will therefore compare the overall medal counts of the two groups with respect to four popular Olympic sports, swimming, athletics, gymnastics, and martial arts. I have counted the medals on an individual basis. So when a relay team wins a medal for Australia, it means one medal for Australia, but up to six medals for individual athletes. Australians have won more medals than Jewish athletes in swimming and athletics, but as in swimming, Jewish track and field athletes surpass their Australian counterparts in terms of excellence. In field events, Jewish athletes have been particularly successful. The greatest discrepancy between Australian and Jewish athletic achievements is in the throwing event. Jewish athletes have won 15 Olympic medals in these events, six gold. Australians have won four, none of them gold. Jewish athletes have set 34 world records in the shot put and discus. One Australian has set a single world record in throwing events. One of the many Jewish women who excelled in throwing events was the Russian discus thrower, Faina Melnik. Melnik won gold at the 1972 games. She was the first female to hurl the discus more than 70 meters and set 11 world records between 1971 and 1976. Harold Abrahams is perhaps the best known of Jewish athletes due to the box office hit, Chariots of Fire. Abrahams won gold in the 100 meter sprint in the 1924 Olympics, equaling the world record. No Australian man has won an Olympic 100 meter race. Yet there have been several Jewish track athletes whose successes exceed that of Abrahams. One of them is Irina Kurzenstein, who I will discuss shortly. In gymnastics and martial arts, Jewish athletes have been far more successful than Australian athletes. In gymnastics, Jewish athletes have won 69 medals, 35 gold. Australian athletes have won a single silver medal. In martial arts, Jewish athletes have won 155 medals, 64 gold. Australian athletes have won 12 medals, one gold. Within the different disciplines of martial arts, fencing is a standout. Jewish fencers have won 105 medals. The obvious question is, why have Jews won so many medals in fencing? There is a reason for this. For 2000 years, Jews have had to defend themselves against anti-Semitic attacks. Eastern European countries in particular were ridden with anti-Semitism during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. During that time, challenging someone who had insulted you to a duel was an effective means of restoring your dignity. An adversary who refused such a challenge suffered the humiliation of being regarded as a coward. It was clearly in the interests of Jews to acquire skills in the martial arts and in particular fencing. It is undeniable that 125 years of Olympic records conflicts with the notion that Jews are no good at sport and in fact proves the opposite. And while the journalist Philip Adams cannot think of too many Jewish sporting heroes other than David with his slingshot, the records reveal a multitude of such heroes. I will now talk about a few of these sporting champions. The discussion will be centered on two swimmers, a track athlete, and the coxswain of the 1936 United States Olympic rowing eights. There are, however, a few dozen Jewish athletes who are equally deserving of mention. I have chosen to consider Alfred Nakash and Eva C.K., not only because of their swimming achievements, but because of the unbearable hardships they endured. Alfred Nakash was born in Constantine in French Algeria, but moved to France in 1933. By 1935, he was the French champion in the 100 meters freestyle 
and was selected to swim for France in the four times 200 meters relay in Hitler's 1936 Berlin Games. The French finished fourth, the place that Olympians dread, good enough to reach the finals but missing out on a medal. For Nakash, this disappointment must have been alleviated by the French beating the Germans into fifth place. Following the 1936 games, Nakash fled Paris with his wife and daughter, moving to Toulouse to avoid the conflict with Germany. During the next few years, he set several national records in the 100 and 200 meter freestyle and the 200 meter breaststroke. During the German occupation of France, Nakash had to contend with racist slurs. The Jew Nakash, one journalist wrote, polluted the waters of French pools. In the meantime, Nakash won 13 French national titles. Following Nakash's defeat of the German champion, Joachim Balka, a French journalist wrote, the Jew Nakash should not be allowed to hold any, Europe, any European titles because he is Jewish. On 6 of July, 1941, Nakash set a new world record for the 200 meters breaststroke. The record stood for five years. Meanwhile, Nakash was working with the Jewish resistance, helping with the physical training of recruits. In 1942, the French Swimming Federation acquiesced to German demands and shamefully banned Nakash from competing in the 1943 national championships. In November, 1943, Nakash was betrayed by a friend and he and his wife, Paula, and two-year-old daughter, Annie, were arrested and deported to Auschwitz. The Nazis killed Nakash's wife and daughter. Nakash was transferred to Buchenwald towards the end of the war. He was freed by the Allies, weighing only 42 kilograms. He was one of only 47 Buchenwald survivors. Less than a year after his liberation, Nakash reasserted himself as the French champion in the 200 meters breaststroke and was included in the national four times 200 meters freestyle relay team. He was also in the French team that in 1946 broke the world record in the three times 100 meter medley relay. In 1948, 12 years after first competing in the Olympics and well past his prime, Nakash again represented France at the Olympics. This time he competed in swimming as well as water polo. How does one survive a Nazi concentration camp and the murder of their family, then return to triumph over such hardship? None of us can know the answer to this question. Nakash was, however, not the only Jewish athlete to do so. Five other Jewish athletes survived incarceration by the Nazis to subsequently compete at the Olympic Games. In a bitter twist, Nakash died by drowning after suffering a heart attack while on his daily swim in the port of Cerberus. Nakash has, however, been, been immortalized. His life was the subject of a French documentary, Alfred Nakash, the swimmer of Auschwitz. Several swimming pools in France have been named after him, one of them being the main pool in the city of Toulouse. He was inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame posthumously in 2019. I'll now turn to Eva C.K., whose surname is spelt S-Z-E-K-E-L-Y. C.K. was 17 in the winter of 1944 when Hungarian arrowhead fascists killed 20,000 Hungarian Jews. C.K. was amongst those rounded up. She was about to be shot when her father explained that she was a Hungarian swimming champion. Tell him your name, her father said. C.K. looked at the arrowhead fascist in charge, seeing one gray and one brown eye, and said her name. She was spared. C.K. again eluded death after Germany entered Hungary. She escaped recruitment into a slave labor battalion by jumping onto a passing car during a forced march and found her way back to her family who were in hiding in a Swiss-run safe house. She kept fit by running up and down the stairs of the five-story building a hundred times a day. In 1945, she was at last able to swim again. In 1948, the woman who as a child had been expelled from her local sports club as an undesirable, swam at the Olympic Games, coming fourth in the 200 meters breaststroke. In 1950, CK won the 100 meter freestyle in an international competition in Budapest. She was awarded the gold medal by the chairman of the Swimming Association, 
and received a special prize from an important officer of the communist political police. As she was handed the trophy, she looked into the officer's eyes, only to see the unforgettable mismatched eyes of the 1944 Arrow Cross leader. CK's determination and dedication finally paid off. At the 1952 Olympics, CK made her mark as an Olympic athlete. She won gold in the 200 meters breaststroke, setting an Olympic record. In 1956, she took silver in the same event. CK described her swimming successes as a safe house against the depredations she had to face under the Nazis. She said, in those days, people were stripped of many things, title, rank, property. Millions were humiliated in their dignity. In that world, Olympic gold was like a fixed, shiny star in the universe. During her career, CK won 44 national titles and set six world records. In 2004, Hungary honored the athlete they had scorned. CK was named one of Hungary's Athletes of the Nation. In 2011, she received the Prima Primissima Award. Many Hungarian athletes did not disclose their religious background in a bid to avoid persecution. CK, however, remained defiantly Jewish. In one TV interview, while discussing the anti-Jewish laws of the 1940s, she declared herself unequivocally Jewish. CK married half-Jewish water polo champion Dizo Giamatti. In the 1956 Melbourne Games, he represented Hungary in the most infamous water polo match of all time. What is not so well known is that four of the 14 contestants were Jewish. Russia had just invaded Hungary, savagely putting down an anti-Soviet uprising. Hungarians were killed in their hundreds. Thousands were imprisoned. The two countries were now to meet in the semi-finals of the 1956 Melbourne Olympics. Giamatti was instrumental in Hungary's win. He opened the scoring and set up Hungary's other three goals. The match was, however, more than a sporting contest. The Hungarian players were bent on salvaging national pride and showing their defiance at the Soviet invasion of their country. Play soon deteriorated into a vicious brawl. The violent play forced the referee to halt the contest. Hungary was ahead 4-0 and therefore declared the winner. The police were required to prevent a riot and protect the Russians from further punishment from the 5,500 spectators. Hungary went on to take the gold. Giamatti is still considered by many to be the best water polo player of all time. He is the only water polo player to win Olympic medals in five successive games. Between 1948 and 1964, he won three Olympic golds, a silver and a bronze. There is, however, more to the Giamatti family. Daughter Andrea competed in the Munich Games in 1972. She set a world record in the 100 meters butterfly in the semi-finals, but in the finals only took bronze. She won silver, however, in the 100 meter backstroke. Giamatti was named Hungarian Sportswoman of the Year. Eva CK, Dizo Giamatti and Andrea Giamatti are the only mother, father and daughter ever to be inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame. Eva CK and her family were three of dozens of brilliant Jewish Hungarian athletes prior to World War II. The Jewish populations of both Hungary and Poland were decimated by the Holocaust. Yet incredibly, it is two Jewish women from the tiny number of surviving Jews who are the most successful Olympians in these two countries. In Hungary, the gymnast Agnes Kaletti shares the ranking of the top Olympic athlete with Aladar Gerovic. They both won 10 Olympic medals. In Poland, it is Irina Kurzenstein who is the most distinguished Olympic athlete. Let me now turn to Irina Kurzenstein. Kurzenstein's parents fled to Russia in the same month that Germany invaded Poland, September 1939. In 1946, Irina was born in a refugee camp in Leningrad. The Kurzensteins returned to Warsaw shortly thereafter. Had they stayed in Poland, they would almost certainly have been amongst the 90% of Polish Jews killed by the Nazis. Kurzenstein evolved into one of the greatest female athletes ever. She was a reedy five foot nine inches in height with the perfect physique for a track athlete. Making use of a devastating kick, she often snatched victory from harrowed rivals in the final strides of a race. Kurzenstein competed at five Olympics between 1964 and 1976. 
She won seven Olympic medals, three gold. It was, however, outside of the Olympics that Kersenstein had her finest moments. She set 10 individual world records. On more than one occasion, she set world records for the 100, 200, and 400 meter sprints. Kersenstein remains the only athlete, male or female, to have held the world record for each of these sprints, something that even the phenomenon Usain Bolt has not managed. In 1965, Kersenstein was Poland's Athlete of the Year and was named the Outstanding Woman Athlete in the World by the official Soviet press agency, TASS. In 2020, Kersenstein was named as the greatest female athlete of all time by America's Track and Fields News Magazine. In 1992, Kersenstein was inducted into the International Women's Sports Hall of Fame. The last Jewish athlete I would like to mention was the coxswain of the American Eights that won gold at Hitler's Games. It is not uncommon to hear of someone discovering their Jewish background late in life. But what if you were to find out you are Jewish just before setting off to compete in Hitler's 1936 Olympic Games? This happened to Bobby Mock. The story of the 1936 USA rowing crew has been told in the gripping book, The Boys in the Boat by Daniel Brown. Mock knew that his family had relatives in Switzerland and Alsace-Lorraine. Assuming he would be picked to cox America's eight-man rowing crew for the 1936 games, Mock asked his father Gaston for the details of his relatives so that he could look them up once in Europe. Gaston hesitated and then replied that he would supply the details should Mock really be picked for Berlin. Mock was duly chosen as cox for America's eights in Berlin. Shortly thereafter, Mock received a sealed envelope from his father with instructions to open and read in a private place. Now anxious, Mock sat alone under a tree to read the letter. The letter provided the addresses of his relatives, but it also brought Mock to tears. He learned that he and his family were Jewish. It was realizing the pain his father must have endured while concealing his Jewish identity in order to succeed in America that so upset Mock. It was Mock's job as the cox to call out the stroke rate. Mock had been trained to keep the stroke count low at the start of a race and to increase the intensity towards the end. His boat would usually be trailing at the halfway mark, but as the stroke rate lifted, Mock's boat would surge past their rivals. The rowing eights was the final event of Hitler's games. 75,000 spectators gathered around Lake Grunau on the 14th of August, 1936 to watch a contest. In the grandstand were Hitler and his henchmen, among them Hermann Guren, Josef Goebbels, and Josef Goebbels. The event was broadcast around the world. Germany shot ahead at the start. Then came Italy, followed by Great Britain. America was at the back of the field. At the halfway mark, the Italians and Germans were in front by more than a boat length. Great Britain had fallen back and was level with the US in last place five long seconds be behind the leaders. The American stroke rate was held at 36, but now the cadence of the Americans began to increase. With 500 meters to go, the US moved to third place. With 200 meters to go, the roar along the water's edge drowned out Mock's call of the stroke rate. The crowd was chanting, Deutschland, Deutschland, in time with the German oarsmen. His megaphone now useless, Mock resorted to beating out the cadence for his eight on the side of the boat. Mock pushed the stroke rate to a near impossible 44. The Americans overtook the Germans in the final 10 strokes, crossing the line with the Italians. No one knew who had won. The crowd now still awaited the decision. It was finally announced that the US won with Italy second and Germany third. After almost six and a half minutes of agony, only a second separated first and third places. Mark and his crew stood quietly while the American flag was raised and the Star Spangled Banner played rather than the German horse vessel. Mark was given credit for the victory. His teammates who could have been excused for cursing him during the race now acknowledge that he drove them to achieve the impossible. We will never know what went through Mock's mind as he pummeled his exhausted crew to victory. Did the discovery that he was of Jewish heritage intensify Mock's will to succeed? 
I like to think so. The pity is that Hitler never knew that a Jewish athlete denied the Nazis victory at the final event of the Berlin Games. The morning after the race, the boys agreed to be filmed by Lini Riefenstahl, the Nazi sympathizer and director of Hitler's propaganda movie Olympia. Riefenstahl wanted close-ups of the victorious coxswain Bobby Mock. The results were spectacular. The eight oar rowing footage contributed some of the most dramatic scenes in Olympia. Riefenstahl made use of close-ups of Mock, shouting commands point blank at the camera. Riefenstahl's movie premiered in Berlin on 20th of April, 1938. The lavish occasion was attended by Hitler, the Nazi elite, representatives of more than 40 countries, as well as military leaders, film stars, and athletes. How would Hitler and his fellow Nazis have reacted had they known that their propaganda movie immortalized a Jewish athlete? There is another irony to the Bobby Mock story. The phrase, no Jew in crew, was long associated with American universities in the days that Mock competed. When the American Eight was selected for the 1936 games, none of the crew, including the Jew, Bobby Mock, knew there was a Jew in the crew. Had it been known that Mock was Jewish, he may not have been selected. Without the tactician Mock, it's unlikely that the US would have taken gold at Hitler's games. Finally, Mock's story illustrates an important point. Did Mock regard himself as Jewish following his father's revelation? We don't know. Yet, Mock's story transcends this debate. What is important is that the Nazis would have defined Mock as Jewish and one of a group of inferior people who are no good at sport. In a delicious irony, the Nazis showcased Mock in their propaganda movie about Hitler's games, unaware that they had made a Jewish athlete the star of their film. In conclusion, Jewish athletes have won more than 500 medals at the Olympic Games. That medal count alone must put to rest the myth that Jews are no good at sport. It can, however, be difficult to change people's minds. It was the Nazi propagandist Josef Goebbels who said, repeat a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. My book is a tribute to the Jewish athletes who deserve to have their achievements recognized and not diminished by falsehoods. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, I, I must say I'm feeling very proud uh, right at the moment. We're, we'll take some questions. Um, just before we do, uh, if you're listening on J Air, this is a live simulcast of the Australian Jewish Association Zoom event, which we have every Wednesday night. Usually we talk about politics, but tonight is a little different. Our guest tonight is Mike Myerson, and he answers the question of, are Jews really no good at sport? Uh, I'll just hand over to David before we take questions and uh, he can tell us about next week and then we'll, uh, we'll go into your questions. And if you haven't put your hand up yet, um, there's, uh, there's Saul there. Now is a good time to do so. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Alan. And uh, I've got a few questions in reserve, certainly. Um, but doing the uh, promo for next week, we are returning to the hard politics and we have an expert on Israel-American relations, and we'll be looking particularly at the shift that's occurred in the Democrats from Jimmy Carter to Barack Obama to Joe Biden, the Democrats' abandonment of Israel with Ruthie Bloom, who's the author of the fascinating book, uh, To Hell in a Handbasket, Carter, Obama, and the Arab Spring, and a very insightful award-winning commentator. And finally, as we always do, um, at the end of this, if there's anyone here who has not yet uh, done these three things, we implore you to do so. Um, we, need a, we need contributions. We can't do the advocacy uh, without resources. So please go to the website, jewishassociation.org.au make a donation, apply for membership, make sure you connect uh, by subscribing for the email list and also uh, follow and like the AJA Facebook page for the daily updates, news and views. So open for questions, Alan. Okay, thanks, David. Um, we've got uh, Saul and Ron. Just before we do, I wanted to ask uh, Mike, 
Um, when you were talking about Philip Adams, as you did at, at, at the beginning, I, I actually took a bit of offence at that comment that he made. Um, and I don't know whether it was because it was him that made it or whether uh, it was inherently a bit offensive in itself. What do you think? Did you, did you have any particular negative reaction um, at the time that you first came across this quote? Well, yes, I think it did have a hint of bigotry um, in it. I mean, you know, how, how can you say a comment like that? He just has to think a little bit. He would surely think about Mark Spitz. He would have been uh, around when Mark Spitz uh, won seven medals, gold medals. So, uh, yes, I do think so. Yeah, he does have some Jewish um, members of his family, either a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law. But uh, no, I just, uh, I just didn't like that particular comment. Okay, we've got Saul, Ron and Jeff. So uh, we'll start with you, Saul. So please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks very much indeed. And thank you for a very interesting talk. But I've got a little bit of a problem. I'd like you to try and help me with these questions. And that is Mark Spitz, for example. Should we regard him as American or Jewish? Was his training the same training as other people in the American team had? So is it a Jewish um, achievement or is it an American achievement by someone who just happened to be Jewish? Should we not rather say that Jews are human beings? Some human beings are good at sport, others aren't. So some Jews mm -hmm. are good at sport and others aren't because Jews are human like everyone else. Is that not a better way of looking at it? I, I think it's a, a, a fine way of looking at it, but why, why I went about the book is that Jews on the whole think they're no good at sport. They don't, they don't, you're the first Jewish person who's suggested another way of going about it. I haven't heard people say that to me. So you got it's a fair enough point, but I was sort of arguing against another point. Okay, fair enough. Um, Ron, your turn. Please unmute yourself. Hi, good evening. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Thank um, you. Have you also looked at um, sports that's not a specifically Olympic sports? For instance, um, in the 1920s, the top soccer champion team in Austria uh, that won the, 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 the cup was a that's Jewish right. team, a Hapoel or something it was called. Akoa right? Vienna, yes. Yes, yes. Yes. And then there's also the rugby players, um, Oki Geffen and Sid Nomis, uh, Ali Bach and cricket and so on. Have you looked at these non-Olympic sports as well? I have, but it's, uh, I haven't had, yes, I have looked at them and I, I know all about them, but I haven't had any published on them, anything published on them. Okay. What about other sports, some of the, the more modern ones, Mike? You know, there's... Uh, sport shooting, for example. I mean, uh, 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 are you following Jewish involvement in some of these newer sports? Um, yes, I do. But I, so, for example, I just um, I, I was just confining myself to the Olympics for this particular okay. because all the records are there. But yes, I mean, in, you know, in surfing, there was Sean Thompson, the South African Sean Thompson, who was he's still a legend, and uh, in in Formula One. There's only one South African who's ever won the Formula One, and that's Jody Schechter. So there, there have been Jews who've uh, succeeded in many other sports. Jessica Fox, the Australian, is the most distinguished paddler in the world, hmm. male or female. And and when when you when you um, identify them as Jewish, uh, what how do you do that? Is there a criteria or um, <laughs> one parent, both parents? Well, that's a very fraught question, and that's a debate that'll go on forever. Yeah. And there are several different definitions, but because I was writing from a, a perspective of racism, I really was identifying them from a racist point of view. So I wouldn't have included you in the book if you had one Jewish grandfather, but from the Nazi point of view, that could qualify you for internment yeah. in a concentration camp. So if you take somebody like Katie Ledecky, is undoubtedly the best female swimmer ever. Her grandmother uh, was a Polish Jew, and she she uh, she was a big influence in Ledecky's life uh, in in terms of succeeding against hardship. So um, is, Ledecky doesn't regard herself as Jewish, but Nazis would have. 
Mm. Okay, uh, Jeff and then Ruven. Jeff, uh, you're ready to go. Shalom. Shalom, Michael. Shalom. As far as Adam, Adam, Adams is concerned, he's a non Jew hating and anti Jewish Jew, and he is actually has a history and it's easily provable, simply a matter of just looking at some of the things that he's written over the last 20 years. He is, he is indeed uses uses the fact that some of his children go to Jewish schools as an ex, as justification for claiming that he's not an anti-Semite. Indeed, that is a, a faux pas that is easily disproven. However, I'm so delighted that you've been able to show that Jewish athletes are able to perform on the world stage and maximum oxygen uptake is indeed a, a, a sham given trait and Jews share in it. And, and one of the best indicators of athletic performance is maximum oxygen uptake and Jews have been known to do very, very well, if only on that test. I wish you well and I thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Um, thank you. The, the interesting angle. I, I mean, I mean, this this oxygen uptake that would that would be a um, a yardstick used by sporting people generally, would it not? Are you talking about the VO two max? Yeah, yeah. That's, what, that's what they mean. VO two max. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, that's a it's, an, it's mainly a, something you're born with. If you're able to transfer oxygen across your lung uh, into your blood at a very fast rate then you are genetically, you know, you, you, you've got all the genetic makeup to become a top athlete, provided you've got all the other things like determination, dedication, etc. Yes, yes. Okay, Robin, please unmute yourself. My science. Oh. I've got, okay. Um, when you, uh, Michael, when you're making a comparison between Australian and Jewish athletes, just want to point out, there were a lot of uh, Jewish uh, uh, ch champion athletes. One of them is right, actually right next to us in days gone by, but that was before the, uh, martial arts was included in the Olympics or certain groups of martial arts. Anyway, my question is, is there a listing of when in, uh, uh, certain sports are, have been introduced, like, uh, for example, uh, the Tai Chi, Taekwondo, whatever it is? This was yeah, yeah. Taekwondo, sorry. Uh, Taekwondo has been only recently introduced into the Olympic Games mm. and there's already been a Jewish medalist in Taekwondo. In fact, in the last Olympic Games, an Israeli uh, woman won a medal. Yeah, are you, are you following Israel's um, achievements in the sporting arena, Mike? Yes, in the Olympics, definitely. Okay, and uh, presumably it's getting better all the time? It is. Okay, okay. <laughs> David, have you got some questions for Mike? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll show you something that I've used concerning uh, Philip Adams recently, seeing that uh, Mike mentioned it, although this is not directly related to sport. But uh, it, it just shows that he's got a, a bit of a history mm -hmm. of being uh, uh, quite vindictive in his commentary. And uh, this particular comment was made when uh, Donald Trump was the President of the United States at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and here's Philip Adams wishing the uh, coronavirus uh, should find its way to Donald Trump. Now as it happens that occurred but uh, Trump recovered quite quickly but it takes a certain character in my view to wish ill on another mm. person and um, he falls into that. Now, I can't let you escape, uh, Mike, without making some comment about perhaps the area I regard it as a sport because it happens to be something that I play, which is chess. Can, can you make any comment about uh, Jewish achievement in uh, chess? Uh, are, you, are you across well, any of that? Well, I'm not very much, but I, I do know that if you wanted to write on that, if you'd be writing an encyclopedia because there are so many brilliant Jewish chess players and it would be a very long book. Not, uh, yeah. it, it could well be that uh, almost 50% of the world's grandmasters um, have been Jewish, yeah. uh, Russian Jews in, in, in particular. Mm. Um, can, you, can you elaborate on some of the modern figures um, that are excelling, that, you know, Jews that excel, uh, that are perhaps, you mentioned Jessica Fox, are there, are there any others that are yes. top tier 
that may not even have reached their prime that we should be watching out for in the next few years? Well, at the last Olympics, there was Jessica Fox, who was just a standout. There was a basketball player, her name is Sue Bird, probably the best in the world. She won her fifth gold medal for America. And there was the fantastic six foot five inch volleyball player, Alex Kleinerman, who won gold as well for America. She's, she would be the best in the world. Um, let me think. Well, that's, 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 that's not bad. Six yeah. foot five inches. Is that what you yeah. said, Mark? That's it. it are, we sure, six, are we sure she's Jewish? <laughs> totally. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, very, very much so. Okay. Um, we've, got a, we've got another question. Yep. The Anthony's there. A Anthony, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, just by way of interest, I'm originally from Western Australia and I had a couple of friends. One of them got third in the world in women's gymnastics and another one got uh, third in the world in a in sailing. So oh, you know, just from a little yeah. place like Perth, we've produced people that have got onto the world map. That's right. Well, when you mentioned sailing, there's Jo Ale from New Zealand. She was originally from Israel. Who won a, I think she's won a couple of Olympic medals, not in this Olympics, but one or two back. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, Mike, um, you spoke a lot about the Jewish athletes and, and they deserve a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the praise that you've, you've bestowed upon them. I'm just wondering about the, the, the behind the scenes team, the coaches and the assistants do we have any any information on on Jewish involvement there? There would be, but I didn't concentrate on that. Okay, I was, I was really specifically confined myself to the athletes. Okay, all but right. About that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Eugene's got his hand up. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, you actually just beat me to that question. I was going to ask about uh, coaches. Uh, there are actually quite few very famous. Jewish coaches and uh, there's one, the, the most famous uh, Soviet or Russian uh, gymnastics coach, Irina Vaina Uzmanova. Uh, she's actually trained a lot of uh, Russian athletes uh, in rhythmic gymnastics, a lot of champions. Yeah, okay, that's uh, very interesting. Um, Mike, just a question I spotted on the chat. Um, I, I imagine your book is very new and we'll ask you where people where people can buy it soon. Um, is there an interest in this topic? Have you found that, that the broader community uh, and perhaps the Jewish communities uh, are showing interest in what you're talking about? Um, well, often when you say to Jewish people, are you interested in, you know, would you be interested in, they're just not interested in sport, a lot of them. Um, and in fact, uh, non-Jewish people have, have had a greater affinity for the book that in, you know, of the few people I've spoken to. They found the stories fascinating because there have been so many hardships, like I mentioned two or three athletes, or all of those four athletes, and the hardships they had to endure, but there, there would be a few dozen in the book. Mm. Of, of, of similar sort of stories. Yeah, okay. Uh, Morris has got his hand up. Uh, please, un oh, you're unmuted, so fire Michael, away, Morris. Michael, I missed the first 10 minutes, my apology. Um, have you done similar research for the Commonwealth Games? No, no. Okay. It, it took a few years to do this, uh, and I'm not going to be doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Mike, um, you, you talked about how the French were 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 correcting the the uh, the way they treated the Jews in in those early days. What about the Germans? Have they have they taken steps to to uh, to redress the, the the views that they took? Yes. Do you mean like, like for example, the, the flat out cousins who won six gold medals? Yeah. They, they, they've been put on uh, German stamps and they've named uh, a couple of roads after them, Flatow Alley, and they have named places after these athletes that they killed. Mm. Yeah. I wonder whether the history books have also, um, are also reflecting the, the truth of, of what happened. Well, uh, you know, uh, there are few history books that concentrate just on on sport, 
Mm. So, yes. the, you know, all the history books, if you read up history books that are on that time period, they may have mentioned a couple of these athletes who were killed, and especially that Vienna Hakoa soccer team, uh, most of them were killed by the Nazis. They were the first overseas team to beat West Ham United, um, and they won the Australian, Austrian championships. So they were a very, uh, very talented soccer team. Mm. Yes. Uh, David, have you got any uh, other questions for Mike? Well, I, I think we should... Uh... I think he's done an outstanding uh, presentation and we, we need to advise people where uh, his book can be purchased and we'll include something in the uh, next email as well, uh, Mark, if there's a, uh, a link you can send as to where people can, uh, uh, can get your book. Well, it's yeah. not in the bookshops, uh, but you can get it through Amazon. You can get it either as a Kindle or a or they printed on demand. So Amazon, and if, if you did go into a bookshop and ask for it, they would know how to get, get you one through one of those channels, such as draft to digital um, We, we have a, uh, just a, a little question in the chat as to whether um, you've made a copy of the book available for the uh, Holocaust Museum. And in fact, you've got an initiative with the Sydney Holocaust Museum. It might be worth making a comment about that, Mike. Yes, so this book, I did give a copy of them for the library, but the book's been re redone and it's the, through the Jewish Museum and it's going to be called Tragedy and Triumph, The Olympics, A Jewish Perspective. That'll be the subtitle. It's going to be a little bit different, but uh, it's got a lot of new stories and it's updated to the latest Olympics. So perhaps if you want a book, if you wait a few more weeks, you can get that one. It will be available in the bookshop at the Jewish Museum. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And also, uh, I, I noticed somebody commented about the Lamb Library in, in Melbourne. They, they would also be very interested to have a, have a copy. So uh, you might find that there is some demand for it. Um, Hopefully. How, how long did it take you to, to, to put this book together, Mike, before we go? Well, I'd say about four or five years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that was obviously a labor of love. Yeah. Well, that's right. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Look, we, we do need to, uh, to wind up. Uh, people listening on J air will soon go back to station, the station programming. Uh, but I want to thank you, uh, Mike. It's a, it's a fascinating topic. And, um, as I said, uh, after you finished, uh, I'm actually feeling a, a little, little more proud of walking a little taller now, knowing that we're not so bad at sport um, as uh, as people tend to uh, to um, portray. So thank you for, for for going to the trouble of of writing the book, and thank you for for the wonderful presentation. Um, is, is there a website uh, other than than Amazon and those particular places, or do people just go to to the standard the standard uh, outlets? They just go to the standard ones. But okay. I also want to say a big thank you to you and David for having me on tonight and uh, and the audience for listening and the interesting questions. No, um, it was good fun. Yep, yep. It was a pleasure thank to you. have you. Just before we go, if, you're, uh, if you still want some Jewish flavoured entertainment, the L'Chaim program with Morris Klein will be starting at 9 o'clock. That's on 3 triple Z, which is FM 92.3 or you can listen online at 3ZZZ.com.au. That's all we have for tonight. Um, we are back to serious politics next week with Ruthie Blum. Don't forget that you can keep up to date with what the AJA is talking about on our Facebook page. So please like and share widely. Michael, we look forward to... Alan, it, we, we just should mention that because of Hanukkah, uh, next week's event will be on Thursday yes. rather than Wednesday. Yes, yes. So next week it is Thursday night, not Wednesday night. Uh, thanks, David. And uh, we look forward to having everybody join us uh, then. Uh, but for now, it's good night to you all. Bye for now. Thank you. Good night.